You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon, and on today's episode, we have Francois Baldessari, the CEO and co-founder of Memfault. He, uh, the, the company is focused on being the first cloud-based observability platform purpose-built for IoT devices that brings the flexibility, speed, and innovation of software development to the hardware side of development. Uh, so we talk a lot about embedded software, how it's changed over the last decade, the challenges IoT device developers have had in monitoring, updating, and securing devices. We also talk about uh, some of the experience that, that, that they're able to share around the uh, building cutting-edge IoT devices for things like Oculus and Pebble, and what they took away from it, what advice um, they can kind of share with you, as well as best practices for IoT device management during the development and the production phases. So a lot of good information here. Uh, I think you'll t- find a ton of value in this conversation. But before we get into this episode, if any of you out there are looking to enter the fast-growing and profitable IoT market, but don't know where to start, check out our sponsor, Leverage. Leverage's IoT solutions development platform provides everything you need to create turnkey IoT products that you can white label and resell under your own brand. To learn more, go to iotchangeseverything.com. That's iotchangeseverything.com. And without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Francois, to the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Thanks, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. Very excited for the conversation ahead. Same here. Um, let's kick this off by having you give a quick introduction about yourself to our audience. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Francois, um, and I'm an embedded software engineer. Um, I've been building devices that you've heard of, like the, the Pebble smartwatch, the Oculus Quest virtual reality headsets. Oh. Um, and I started my career building much less exciting devices when I built servers at Sun Microsystems. But I think more pertinent to, to what we're talking about today, I'm the founder of, and CEO of a company called Memfault, where we've been thinking really hard about embedded software and IoT and, and, and how to make the lives of engineers who are building the future uh, uh, easier and better. Fantastic. So I, I, I guess I have to ask you before we dive in further about your what you did with, uh, with Oculus. Yeah, so I joined Oculus originally as just another embedded software engineer. Um, it okay. was it was shortly after the the Facebook acquisition, and uh, and at that time, you know, Oculus was was growing like crazy. I think that I joined, there were maybe five hundred people. By the time I left, I think there were five thousand people. So you can imagine it was it was there was a lot going on. But the really exciting thing I got to do is work on Oculus Quest and the transition from this PC VR where you plugged in your VR headset into a PC. Right. And into standalone VR um, and, and these kind of all-in-one devices. If you've never tried Oculus Quest, it's an amazing experience. Oh, um, yeah, I, I have one. That's why I had to ask. <laughs> yeah, and I was lucky enough that, that I ended up leading the embedded software team. So I got to see not just you know, the code itself, but also think about how do we build these devices and, and right, right, how right. do we make these teams more efficient? Fantastic. Um, so, so let's let's talk a little bit more about Memfault and the company um, uh, on your from your side of things. Talk about a little bit high level, kind of what you all do, role you all play in IoT. And I'm also curious to just hear about the opportunity you saw to kind of build this and uh, and 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 kind of bring this, you know, to to be a company. Yeah, I'm going to to answer your questions a little bit backwards, and I'll start with the how because I think it explains the what we do. Um, You know, in 2014, I was an engineer at a company called Pebble that made smartwatches. So, you know, devices on your wrists that get your notifications and have sensors, all kinds of things. Um, And at Pebble, you know, although we were firmware engineers building firmware, you know, the the, the way that we all build firmware, um, you know, we were struggling with a lot of things that that, um, actually are are traditionally, traditionally software problems. Because our our watch was so complicated, it had a multi-threaded operating system. It had third-party applications. You could install apps on it. Um, It had a UI. You know, because it was so complex, we had a lot of software running on it. And so we updated it every couple of weeks, introduced some new features, introduced some new bugs. And inevitably, we'd spend our lives just tracking down problems like the Bluetooth not connecting or the Mm. watch, you know, running out of battery, things like that, that would take, you know, all of my time. Right. People would just mail those watches back to us and we cracked them open. It required a hammer and a heat gun because they were glued together. It was a really arduous process. And then we'd connect our debugger and we'd eventually figure out what might have happened to the device. And that just felt crazy to me. It was such an intense 
kind of effort to just understand what had happened to our customers. And, and you know, next to me was an iOS engineer, a guy who was working on a mobile app. And, and when I told him, how do you do this? He showed me he was using a piece of software at the time called Hockey App. And okay. whenever someone had a problem anywhere in the world, he'd get a report automatically with a backtrace, with a memory, with everything he needed, the logs, to fix the problem. And I thought, I want that. And so from there on out, I went on a mission to build tools to give me the same kind of observability, the same visibility and diagnostics that software engineers have had, but for my hardware devices. And that's what we're building at Memfold. We're giving you the power of observability, the power of remote diagnostics in the context of an IoT product. And I'm very happy to say we built it at Pebble for ourselves. It mm. made our life so much easier. And now that we've been selling it and building it to companies like Skip and Whoop, SunPower, Vercada, and many others, we've gone yeah. to see that same transformation operate. Uh, and if you want, I can give you more details about how this works. But but hopefully that gives you a good idea of what it is. Yeah, if, if you could kind of break that down at, at a high level to talk about how it works, that would be fantastic. So at a very high level, our product is made up of two pieces. First, okay. we have the SDK. So small piece of C software, very, very small. It's about two kilobytes of code space and one okay. kilobyte of RAM. Um, it works on pretty much any connected device. And we we enter, we in uh, implement that SDK into your device through a firmware update. It takes about two weeks of work. And that little SDK collects signals from your device. It collects kind of uh, faults being reported. It collects battery level. It collects mm. Wi-Fi statistics, whatever else, and uploads them to the clouds where we analyze all this data and give your engineer like day-by-day -day insights on what problems your customers are experiencing and how sure. you can fix them. Fantastic. That's awesome. So I, I did want to, um, you mentioned some interesting brands that you work with. You mentioned you work with Whoop. Is that, um, what are you able to kind of tell me on that front? Yeah, so I can tell you a, a little bit. Of course, I, I want to be mindful of, sure. of their, their confidential information. But long story short, we've been very excited to work with the folks at Whoop who, like we did at Pebble, make a, a, a wearable device that you wear on your wrist. And of course, like we experience at Pebble once they reach scale. I mean, Whoop makes a lot of devices. They're everywhere these days. Of course, they start having in the margin, you know, a few problems that keep creeping up. And when you have 100 devices, you know, a problem that happens once every 10,000 hours, you never see it. But when you have a million devices, a problem that happens once every 10,000 hours, all of a sudden is happening all the time and is hammering right. your support team and is driving your RMAs. Right. So with Whoop, our focus has been on giving them the visibility they need to nail down those issues, fix them instead of spending hours of customer support time tracking them down one customer at a time mm. and drive that RMA numbers down, drive okay. the number of customer requests down and make their product better and better. And, and we're so okay. excited. We've, we've, they've actually been increasing their involvement with us every year. So they're, they're a great customer. So let me ask you, as we kind of talk about the embedded software side of things, how, from your perspective, being in this space for such a long time, um, how has it kind of changed over the years? Um, you know, maybe over the last decade or so, kind of where, where how, how have we evolved kind of where we are now? I've, I've seen a crazy transformation. I, you know, if I think about what we did when I started my career, not so long ago, right? I started my career in 2007 um, uh, or started working with embedded devices in 2007. At that time, what you could get for $1 as a Mac controller, it had what, like two kilobytes of RAM, mm -hmm. it had maybe a couple kilobytes of flash. And so at the time you really didn't write software. What you did is you wrote a little control loop. You might have you know, a little sensor acquisition thing and, and you'd logged out to serial, but you certainly weren't building complex data structures. Today, if you buy the top of the line STM32, you get two megabytes of RAM, you know, you yeah. get like, you get basically a computer for a couple bucks and super low power consumption. And so people are starting to build real complex software on that. I've, I've heard of people doing you know, machine learning at the edge, right? It's like companies like Edge Impulse, or I've seen people doing uh, computer vision at the edge. I remember chatting with folks at a company called VergeSense who does, you know, did a bunch of machine vision uh, on, on their embedded devices. This is, you know, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of lines of code, 
And so, and so necessarily it's changing the way that we build these devices and it's changing the way that we kind of envision the long-term value that they provide. Increasingly, I think you'll notice two interesting trends. First, IoT companies have way more software engineers than hardware engineers in 2022. It used okay. to be the opposite. They used to have right. way more electrical, mechanical engineers, but that has switched. The other thing is they're adopting software business models. So they're no longer just selling devices for a fee. What they're usually doing is they're selling a service, they're selling consumables, they're monetizing over time because that's how software is sold. And so our industry is actually turning into much more, much more of a software industry than a hardware industry. And right. that transformation has been dramatic and it's changed the way we work. Absolutely. That's great. Thanks for kind of breaking that down for us. Um, I, I did want to kind of, so as we've been talking about more physical devices in this conversation, um, what are some of the challenges IoT device developers have had in you know, monitoring, updating, securing devices as compared to, you know, the software development side of things. Yeah, I, you know, this is, this is the thing that led me to create this company. Um, mm. in, in the software world, when you need to figure out how to monitor something, update it, kind of maintain it, you don't have to, to reinvent the wheel, right? right? There's eight different companies will sell you off-the-shelf software, and there's mm -hmm. a very well-established way to solve those problems. Right. In the IoT world, you know, there's, there's really not enough off the shelf. There's not enough like software that you can buy to, to fix, solve those problems and address those challenges. And right. so what are people doing? They're building it. And so we're looking at companies who are startups. They have 30 employees and here they are building an entire OTA systems from scratch. They're building entire log connection collection systems from scratch. They're just building an entire set of infrastructure not because they want to, not because they, they wish they had, they, they were excited about hiring infrastructure engineers to build this, but because it's the only way. And in 2022, you need a way to update your devices. Like it's mm -hmm. no longer good enough to just put a device out there and stop worrying about it. And so, and you need a way to monitor your devices. So these companies make that, realize that, and they start investing heavily in infrastructure, building it. Right. But every dollar and every headcount they spend building infrastructure is dollars and headcounts that don't go towards building better products. Sure. And so, so I think that, that this has been a major challenge. And again and again, we run into companies who tell us, we've just spent $2 million building custom infrastructure. We wish we'd found you two years ago, right? Absolutely. That's... Um... It's always been an interesting conversation when we kind of talk about the two different sides of this, right? The software side and the device, um, uh, the hardware side of things. So it's interesting to kind of get your perspective and, and really tie this back into the company you built is actively solving a problem that is very, very apparent. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think that you talk about the software side versus the hardware side. Um, and it's funny because in our heads, those are such different dichotomies. We really mm. think about hardware and software as different disciplines. But what I'm seeing is increasingly they're doing really, really similar work, but they're sure. doing it very, very differently. And so over time, I believe that we will, we will unify engineering practices and we will unify the way we work. Sure. And that we'll look back at this time where we thought of hardware and software as completely distinct things yeah. as a time where we hadn't figured it out yet. Sure. And in IoT, I mean, it kind of, they, I mean, they, they have to work together. I mean, that, that's, that's how we're successful in the deployments or, or we're not if, they're not, if they're not thought about in the same light. Um, so that's a very good point. I did want to also kind of ask you to, to, to share some thoughts on if we're, if, you know, we have device developers out there, companies that are working in device management, what are some of the things you've noticed from like that are best practices when it comes to the development and production of devices themselves and kind of integrating that in on the embedded side and uh, on the software side and so forth? Yeah, I think there, there's uh, three things that okay. companies who build hardware maybe need to spend a little bit or increasingly will find themselves thinking about. Okay. The first one is security. I think that historically we've gotten away with, I think maybe fewer investments in security in the hardware space than, than the software industry has had to reckon with. And increasingly it's coming back to bite us, right? We see, you know, IP cameras being repurposed to create botnets. We see people's devices being remotely disabled or, or, or 
being used to spy on folks. Um, you know, for example, I, I, I own a baby monitor and I'm very, yep. very mindful that that not be used to watch my baby from the internet, right? Of course. Those are real concerns. Yeah. Uh, concerns. And so I think that, you know, early in the development cycles, companies need to build a security strategy. And it can be as simple as starting to secure your OTA updates, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's, you know, cryptographically sign your firmware to make sure nobody else is loading firmware on your devices uh, but, but you. That's number one. Number two is, you know, employ cryptography to secure the link between your device and the cloud. Whether you're just yep. doing, you know, TLS or even MTLS, just thinking about this upfront and employing standards where possible, it will save you a ton of time. And more, more importantly, it will save you from that terrible, terrible phone call you might receive two years from now about the fact that your device got compromised. Right. Um, so that's, I think that's top of mind. The other one is, of course, sustaining. I think as, as hardware engineers, we get so focused on shipping. You know, it's, you go through EBT, DVT, PVT, you work so hard, you, you know, go to the manufacturing lines to debug, test fixtures, and then the product is out and you feel like you're done. And the reality is that, that today that's no longer true. You're not done when the device leaves the factory mm. because these devices are connected to the clouds. They provide ongoing value. They, they potentially need to evolve as the customer need evolves. And so really we need to start thinking about not just how do we the next two years look like to get this device out the door, but what right. does, what's our five-year strategy to make sure those devices provide maximum value to our customers? So between that and security, I think those are the two bigger blind spots I see. Yeah, security is an interesting one because um, it, it, the conversations I've had so far have really been around when does security need to be thought about in order to be brought into an IoT solution successfully? And it's really like never can be too early to be thinking about it. But right. oftentimes, security is, is an afterthought for a lot of people. And it comes back to bite them um, later on down the road. So, so I think the fact that you kind of emphasize how important that is, is, is crucial to, for people to really understand. Yeah, security should be part of your electrical design, right? right. And so that means it's the very, very beginning. There's nothing worse than, than thinking you're almost ready to ship your product. And then you do your security review and you realize that you need to add a security a secure element to the bomb, right? Now you've got to spin the board. You've got to redo all those tests. You've got to you know, change your calibration and manufacturing process, processes. And you just delayed your product, product by three months. Right. Uh, it, it, there has to be a secu security review at the design stage. And I yeah. think that that's a mindset change. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I definitely, definitely agree. Um, one of the last questions I want to ask you kind of before we, we start to wrap up here is around challenges you've seen in the space. And this can be from any perspective, but one area I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on is around the the view device developers, the device creators have when it comes to having certain constraints around what's physically possible versus what the customer uh, is is looking for and expecting or asking of them to build because there obviously are different constraints that you know the the buyer may not necessarily understand or want to understand but they're realistic so how do you kind of handle or how have you seen those types of conversations go how do you see that playing out in the market and what kind of advice do you have for both sides to be thinking about that a little bit differently yeah i think everyone who's ever built a product has run into this frustration which is you know, you, you put your product out there, you get right. it in the hands of your customers, and all of a sudden they start saying like, why didn't you just dot, 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 and they tell you, why didn't you just add this feature? Why didn't you just do this or that? Um, and and it's, I think it's because we make it look so easy. You know, companies, mm -hmm. uh, great IoT companies make it look like it, it's nothing to build and, and ship and scale a fleet of IoT devices, but it's actually very, very difficult. And throughout the project, we make really hard trade-offs. And oftentimes it's not physics that limits us. You know, some companies run into physics, right? If you're making, right. trying to build AR headsets, there are major physics challenges to, to sure. solve. But right. more often than not, it's costs, right? Okay. And so, and so what, I, what I find is oftentimes people say like, well, why can't I install, you know, three more things on this device? Or why can't I save like, 10 hours of video rather than five hours of video. And the reality is like adding a bigger flash chip would, would add 10 bucks to the price of the device and people aren't willing to pay those 10 bucks. And so I think the first thing is talking about those trade-offs a little bit more and, and, and explaining that engineering is about finding the, the best bang for the buck, which customers really relate to. 
The other yeah. thing I found is that it's oftentimes when customers ask about something very, very specific, mm -hmm. usually behind it, there's a deeper need that is unaddressed. Sure. If you can get to that deeper needs, you can oftentimes learn something important for your business. So for example, a customer might say, oh, I, you know, I get a, a 10 second snippet from the camera when a cat walks by. And right. I wish this was a 20 second snippet. And, and what the customer really, the reason they're complaining is because it takes, what they want to know is they want to be able to identify who it is that walked by. And for some yep. reason, the camera activates too quickly and it's not enough, not enough time to see who walked by. And I think if you get to that basic need, I wish I could identify better who walked by, there might be software solutions. You might be able to kind of change when you start recording, or you might be able to change kind of how you explain things or what you display in your application. And so, you know, always getting to the bottom of customer needs can avoid you some serious trouble and avoid you from building things that can be really expensive when a, a cheap fix might have addressed their underlying needs. So I hope that helps. It's a complicated question, of course. Yeah, I think a big piece, too, is just on the um, understanding where both sides are coming from and also the educational component. The more understanding somebody has coming into that equation, from, especially from the customer side, on what's possible and, and the limitations and the potential for what they're trying to, to, to have built, the better. If they come in with real, unrealistic realistic expectations, you kind of run into these problems. And it's a very frustrating process when you're on the technical side, for sure. So um, so that that makes a lot of sense. And, and I appreciate you kind of shedding some light on that because it, it is something that I don't think people really understand how much of a of a, um, a, a roadblock block that can cause at times, even um, uh, when, when you kind of get into those kinds of conversations. One thing I'd like to add on this topic is that yeah. oftentimes customers, what they say is different from what they really want. <laughs> right. And so, and so I always push people to look at the data, right? Like yep. Make sure you collect the right information so that you can actually make some, some data-driven decisions about what your customers are actually doing with your product. And that's right. something, of course, that we help with. There are other ways to do it, but the, the most important Thing I'll say is get your get your hands on the data and, and see yeah. what you can actually read from that. Absolutely, uh, that's great advice. Um, this conversation has been very enlightening. Thank you so much for for taking the time to do this. Um, I did want to ask. So for our audience out there who wants to learn more, kind of what Memphot's doing, kind of you know what you have going on, follow up to anything we talked about here today. What's the best way they can reach out? Yeah. So the best way to reach out is to find us on our website at memfault.com. That's the name of the company.com. You can also find us on Twitter. The handle is Memfault. Um, hopefully easy enough to remember. Last but not least, we're always excited to hear from people. So don't hesitate to shoot us an email at hello okay. at memfault.com. Fantastic. And anything kind of uh, on the horizon that we should be on the lookout for and paying attention to coming out of the company soon? Yeah, what I'm what I'm really, really excited about is the idea of fleet sampling, which okay. is, you know, imagine you have 10 million devices out there. Sure. And you want to know what the top problems are with them. Okay. You know, one thing you could do is instrument all 10 million devices, but that's going to cost you a lot of money because it's a lot sure. of data. Sure. But what we find is that if you instrument 10% of those devices or even 5% of those devices, you can get 90% of insights. So wow. this is something we're working on, selecting the right sample of devices to give mm. you those insights and tell you what your top problems are for sure. 10 times cheaper. Wow. Fantastic. Well, we'll be on the lookout for that, and um, we'll make sure we link up the, the Twitter handle, the com the website, all the different information about the organization, and all the um, the the push that we do when we promote this, all the descriptions and so forth. So, um, I really implore kind of our comp our our audience out there to to reach out and, and learn more about what you're doing. So, I think what you have going on is fantastic. So, so thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for your extremely thoughtful question. I love the conversation. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Thanks again for watching that episode of the IoT for All podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to hit the bell notification so you get the latest episodes as soon as they become available. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.